Science Center. Um, and what it really focuses on is this intersection between science, economics, and politics. Uh, it tries to continue the legacy of Don Bevan uh, by examining current issues affecting both fisheries and conservation. Of course, we try to present as many viewpoints as possible in the series. Um, and this year, we're really looking at everything from recreational fisheries to tuners to sharks to talks on how to communicate your science better. Our first speaker, as you know, is David Armstrong, who's the director of the school. And I can think of really no one better to introduce him than the associate director, oh. <laughs> Andre Hunt. And so I'm going to hand over to him to do the introduction to our first speaker in the 12th Bevan series. Thanks, Trevor. Um, it's always sort of special at this time of the year when it's freezing outside and well, it's snow, I guess, this year. And, um, the first talk in the series for me is always pretty special because it usually is sort of one of our own. Um, we all know who the speaker is today. Um, but I'll give a few bits and pieces that I've collected. Uh, the first thing that usually happens when someone introduces the speaker is they talk about their time in grad school together. Um, and the field work they did together. Um, in our case, this is going to be a bit of a challenge, so I, I'll skip that set. Um, what's that rude mock? Um, so, uh, just a few things about Dave before we get the details of his background. He did his degree uh, in biology at UC Irvine. I'm not allowed to say when, but it was. was it? Before, yeah, it was just before last year sometime. Uh, master's thesis at OSU, and he got his PhD at UC Davis. Uh, and for all of those students who are currently PhD students, as far as I can work out, you're a faculty member here just when you finished your thesis. It was wet. <laughs> <laughs> and so he joined the school in uh, 1978, uh, which does seem like a while ago, and done, has done truly amazing things in the, the realm of his species of affection. So as, a, as a model, I don't have a, have a taxa. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, as a model, I don't really have a ta taxon. Taxon <laughs> of emotion. But, but Dave, uh, if you read the literature, I'm involved with the management of crab stocks in the North Pacific. If you read through the literature, the name Armstrong is hard to avoid. Uh, usually with a lot of et al's after them, and students of Dave's um, that have looked at the dynamics of pretty much every crab whose name, species name I don't actually know how to pronounce it for. It's not good, and I wouldn't help. Uh, crab in the North Pacific, Dungeness crab, prawns, various other things. Um, Dave has been at this for a long time. Now let me see if I can get my one and only slide that I'm permitted. Sure. Yeah, you want to turn the light out. Dave, you may not want to look at this. <laughs> so there are a couple of things to look at. I'm told that this, these are both Dave. <laughs> the person who um, gave me these slides is allegedly, as soon as this talk is finished, she's leaving from somewhere. Um, uh, probably and um, So just a few more things to, I, I felt as a statistician I needed to have statistics. So the first thing I did was I wanted to find out what Dave's uh, H index was, because that's the statistic of measure these days. I typed in D.A. Armstrong, which I think is what I should have done, and his H index according to Publish or Perish is something like 297. This stuff. Which is pretty good until you realize that about every second scientist is called D.A. Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I stopped at that point. Uh, I tried another statistic. Uh, and a statistic that if you're an undergrad, you're probably more familiar with than if you're a geriatric like myself, which is rate my professor. Okay, so rate my professor is a way that um, students can write anonymous comments about their professors. Um, Julia, where is she? There she is. Actually, if you go to Julia, and I'm sure after the lecture, not during the lecture, you can go on your uh, smartphone and, and see your favorite staff professor. Julia actually gets a chili 
uh, which means she's hot according to at least <laughs> one student. <laughs> this should not reveal how that student is in her class. Um, Dave, unfortunately, didn't rank. Really? No, not at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what I did was I I went to another set of statistics. Dave has been director here since 1998, uh, which is an impressive duration. Don't steal my sounds. Um, and during that time, of the 35 faculty we have today, 20 were hired, which is a uh, I can't remember. The, I worked out the percentage. The total number of grad students during Dave's time here as director is 375. The total number of journal publications, now I've got book chapters and <coughs> books, markers took this very seriously, the number of journal chapters is 1,419. Those are mine. Those are all yours. <laughs> in, the good old, in, the, in the good old days, the director used to always be a co-author. You just forgot about that. <laughs> Um, anyway, I think it's time that Dave took over. Uh, I did have a whole lot of stories, but I had to divide them into two categories. The stories I could tell you, but you wouldn't be interested in. The stories I couldn't tell you, but you would be interested in. Um, but one final thing I did discover is that Dave is a cultist. You know about this, right? I do. You do. I remember it. You remember it. According to this envelope, which was found in my pigeonhole, he is a member of the Crab Cult. And this piece of wood is his official medallion. So perhaps after his talk, uh, you can come and see Dave's, uh, I don't know what you call your membership to a cult. Anyway, it's time for me to sit down and for Dave to take over and tell us about, how quick did you come up with this title? I'll mention that. <laughs> Cause, causes, climate, core, a cavalcade of true crab sagas. And the thing to look at that before I hand over, the thing about these figures, there's two things here that if you know Dave are integral to him. There's the crab and then there's the smile. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> So I've walked around to look at the history of the Bevan series. And after this is done, when you're milling around out at the reception, look at what are now 11 framed posters, uh, the chronology of the Bevan series from start to now. It's an amazing series. And it's uh, in honor of an amazing man. And uh, let's see, how did we finally work this out? We worked it out that way. Tanya, can you come up here with me? No. no, 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 absolutely not. But the Bevan series was started uh, based on a conversation one day with Tanya, who was uh, you know, a little concerned that the endowment she had started in honor of Don was just sitting and not going anywhere. And as fortune would have it, or fate, I guess it was, I had been talking to Julia, and so typical of Julia, she had some sense of a, a series, a seminar series to begin in the school that would be at a reoccurring time and based in some notion of sustainable fisheries. And Tanya had a professorship or an endowment. And Julia had an idea. And so the two came together. And for those of you, year after year, who have heard Bevan, Bevan, who've seen 
Tanya does, and this is Tanya. And he had an amazing career, just some of the highlights. You read up there, he was dean of the then little tiny College of Fisheries that was so well known and comfortable to many. And then when we merged into the College of Ocean and Fisheries Sciences, he was associate dean of that, uh, but also along the way, director of the School of Fisheries. And at that time, he was immersed in fisheries politics. As an example, uh, he was chair of the Snake River Salmon Recovery Team, co-founder of FRI, Fisheries Research Institute, that is, was the premier uh, research institute of its day and is still known for that up in Alaska. Now he was very involved in science-based management and this is a quote attributed to him that good science is always good politics. And he liked politics, economics, law. He was multifaceted in that sense. And uh, played a, a major role in Magnuson Fisheries Conservation and Management Act. Uh, he was a member of all of the right and important and influential councils in North Pacific, on the Science and Statistics Committee, and he had a very keen interest in the emerging international fisheries, especially those in the Barents Sea, that's a little part of the talk today. And the nice thing about that is he began making trips to Russia. And during one of those trips, he met you, a fisheries biologist. And um, not so long after, you married and moved to Washington State. So this is Don Bevan, and this is Tanya Bevan. And while the, the series still honors Don for sure, it seems to me as I stood out there looking at the 11 years of this history, the Bevan series absolutely honors you as well. You have nurtured it by virtue of your passion for Don and his memory and legacy. You can say, OK. Do you want the microphone? No, no, don't use to uh, go to Russia to have some, I don't know, uh, some kind of a meetings and uh, negotiations so forth. And he used to say that the most successful negotiations were with me. Ah. <laughs> Is as much for you and the legacy that you've helped create. Thank you. And also, I just want to say how much I appreciate that what was uh, actually the this idea and then Julius about how I can put some money in this endowment fund. And it just happened in 1995. Big dream fell on our house. And then um, we decided to go to the loggers and they, got, they gave us. that uh, characterize a lot of my program 
from the mid 80s uh, to the present time. And um, the reason Dungeness and other crab fisheries are, or species are so useful is that invariably they are fisheries. And by virtue of being fisheries, they command a lot of attention. There's inevitably a lot of resource to be devoted to research uh, on them. Can I have my pointer here, is that right? Yes, I do. And Dungeness crab is a rich fishery. It's also well known for these cycles of abundance that repeat about every seven to eight years. And in Washington State, it's the richest coastal fishery we have for salmon, all ground fish, and dollar shrimp. It is only exceeded by commercial shellfish aquaculture. So it's an important fishery, one that is uh, regarded as sustainable despite this crazy fluctuation that you see and recently was certified that way by the Marine Stewardship Council for Oregon. Uh, in recent time, Washington landings continue to be very high, approaching 17 million pounds, and it is about a $40 million uh, ex-vessel fishery. It's also one that's considered to be conservatively managed. You see in this great photo by Greg Jensen, a male holding a female, and it's the 3S system of size, season, and sex. Like most U.S. crab fisheries, it's a male-only fishery. And the presumption is that each male has individually had an opportunity for one mating event before they molt to legal size and are vulnerable to the fishery. Um, and it uh, is an interesting challenge in that respect, particularly when we get later to the Bering Sea. But for the most part, it seems to work despite the fluctuations that you saw in the previous slide. Uh, the life history is characteristic of these sorts of pelagic, neuroplanktonic uh, reproductive species, and it starts just to start somewhere with uh, that's, that's the ovigerous female carrying about a half million eggs that she'll extrude in the fall, and they'll develop for several months and begin hatching in wintertime into these zoeal stages that are the true planktonic form. There are five zoea, and they can be understandably moved uh, great distances along shore and invariably on offshore, which is an important part of the recruitment uh, process. They come ashore as the megalop stage, the fuzzy little megalope down there. They search for and settle to certain benthic habitats, ideally, also begin to enter estuaries along parts of the coast where those are present. Big estuaries like San Francisco and, of course, uh, our Grace Harbor, Willapa Bay, and the lower Columbia. And they are stunning in abundance when they first settle, as you'll see in a moment. They grow for uh, several years, and at about age two and a half, reach sexual maturity. The males continue to grow at a faster rate, and they reach legal size in the fishery from about three and a half to four years. They've made it along the way, ideally, and the life cycle continues. The geographic point I'm looking, I should start this, but I see a talk back there, uh, of these stores will be the outer coast of Washington. You can see Grace Harbor, Willapaw Bay, and the lower Columbia. And uh, these, to a large degree, represent proverbial nursery habitat for the species. There are extensive Brown River estuaries, with myriad uh, subtital, secondary, subtitle channels, well mapped, well studied in both cases of Willapong and Grace Harbor uh, for a variety of reasons. And it's into these kinds of systems every mid spring, late spring, early summer, this stage begins to arrive. And the megalops of most crabs, in, in uh, both the, this category and the the lithotic crabs in Bering Sea, they're strong swimmers. The five previous wheel stages are kind of go with the drift of the ocean, but these have very directional swimming capability, can pick up cues of various sorts and go that direction on purpose, and eventually are able to go from distances offshore on the shelf proper to ideally near shore in estuarine settlement. And there, my mouse works. This is great footage just to give you a feeling for this. So every little dot in this picture taken by Sean and Kirsten, if she's here, is a Dungeness megalope coming into eelgrass, as you see, uh, 
hundreds of millions is not an exaggeration. Who knows? Make it a billion or more. Uh, they get into systems like the big coastal asteroids, or they settle directly onto the benthos of uh, the nearshore shell. That's coming up above from the drop camera. And in fact, this is probably around Orcas Island. Padilla Bay, yeah. Um, and as you saw previously, the, the initial settling densities are almost monocultures in some places of these little crab. And that doesn't last. There's obviously a whole armada of things waiting to eat them. Um, reasons of coming to estuaries, among others, are the great places to grow. These are showing comparative data of the uh, growth rate in, over time the standard measure of carapace width from settlement. This is the same year class, same cohort, but some have settled offshore uh, you know, in water that's maybe 30 to 50 meters deep, and this group has settled in an estuary. And the growth rate is not surprising. The difference based on temperature for uh, that thermal reason alone, always a significant gradient between an estuary and thermal regime and the coastal one. So they grow large, they get bigger fast, and in that they begin to escape uh, a number of predators with a mouth that was previously big enough to take them down. The other reason estuaries are such good places to end up is that there's a lot of refugia. Uh, refuge in the form of marshes, tidal flats, eelgrass beds, quite a bit to hunker under when you're that small because you're fair game for everything. But as noted here, um, shell is a particularly good, good material to find early in life. And the first little saga brings us to shell. And it was our involvement, a group of us, in what came to be known as the Rafiti decision. This is the cause, in a sense. And that was a federal court case brought by the tribes of this state against the state of Washington to get treaty redress uh, for the 1850 treaties. And the group I was part of, had the role of extensive literature review and research to help the judge and the courts define usual and custom areas where they harvested the species, invertebrate species that they harvested historically, and then anything in the form of introductions that had led to commercial value since the trees. Um, and eventually, Edward Graffiti, the judge, ruled in favor of the tribes and declared that they had permanent rights to half of the shellfish resources as they had been given for salmon in the case of the Bolt decision. Well, along the way, um, Shell became an interesting part of this little tale. That was the discovery in the literature of the fable of how an introduction from the East Coast, the soft shell clam Maya, came to be important habitat, refuge habitat for little crab. In the story, very briefly, is uh, based in San Francisco Bay. And this is San Francisco in the 1850s, or time before it was so, so changed. So all the green is essentially gone in present time. And virtually all of this little, uh, whatever it is, flesh-colored inner tide is gone in current-day San Francisco. But there had been ship traffic between San Francisco and what was called Shoalwater Bay, Willapa, almost since the time of the gold rush to begin bringing native oysters down for the crazy gold rush uh, era that quickly depleted all the native oysters in San Francisco. Um, right after the railroad was finished and the product started to move east-west, Maya, the soft shell plant, was introduced into San Francisco inadvertently. But in about five years, was a major fishery of several million pounds. So the question we always wondered was, what sort of larval infection process was used to eventually colonize and work its way up the coast. That was the assumption. In the course of the literature review for the tribal uh, lawsuit, we learned how it really got up the coast. And it was at a time when people had a sense of manifest destiny such that they would introduce and introduce a really good thing where they lived to a new place because it wasn't there and it ought to be there. And as you have read, it came uh, to be in Willapa Bay, Shoalwater, by the uh, authorization of Captain Simpson. Simpson, who ran a bunch of these oyster trading ships. And based on how well they did in San Francisco, told his skippers, take them up, dump them in, let's see what happens. And they did, and by 
the 1880s, it was a major resource. In fact, in these chronologies of fisheries biologists reporting to the Fish Commission in the 1880s, Willapon Grace Harbor are stippled in a way that shows its pervasive um, distribution of Maya. And then it went away. Uh, further accounts of this historic bit of sleuthing and newspapers out of Aberdeen uh, indicated that all of a sudden, where you had previously been able to just find unlimited soft shell clam, now you know, there's none to be found. Some sort of epizootic, some sort of disease or whatever killed them, and there are now bushels and bushels of dead shell everywhere. And that is true to today. This is the relic, the surviving death assemblages, as they're called, of that old Maya population that just died in short order from unknown causes and sits to this moment out on the inner tidal of Grace Harbor. And as your eye can appreciate, it becomes a great uh, refuge habitat for incoming little young of the year Dungeness crab. And just to give you a sense of scale, you're looking across some particular tide flat to the shipping lane, and that's a real tanker in the background. So there are thousands of hectares of this old relic shell that's been in place. And year after year, absolutely works as recruitment habitat for these incoming very, very tiny seven millimeter uh, first instars. And the reason it's so appreciated by them is this example from Jan's thesis work. Um, that mouth is the last thing you see as you go down the throat. Uh, if you are not hunkered into whatever appropriate refuge habitat. And when we first began to survey the Maya death assemblages, I couldn't quite comprehend what I was seeing, but it was almost like fleas moving in the interstices of the shell. There was so much of it. But the, the odd part of the, the life history of community ecology is that, not surprisingly, those little crab will eat every one of the little Maya in a given year that settled to that shell that they're hiding in to the point that they're exterminated, they're eliminated. And so what's happened is that there has been no recruitment of new Maya to the death assemblages in decades because every year the Dungeness crab saturated. And so now the extant population that's the larval source is limited to this fringing habitat that's beyond the foraging range of the physiological tolerance of little crab. And, uh, what it means eventually is that this resource will be eliminated over time through physical processes and degradation because there is no renewal of it due to the ongoing predatory activity of the little crab. We'll skip that except for the last bullet. The Maya saga, way down there at the bottom, uh, suggested a solution though to another problem, a very big problem in these estuaries. And that's this little second song, uh, the, the history of the Army Corps of Engineers, who is still in there to this day, dredging and keeping open the navigation channel. But um, about 15 years or more ago, there was a proposal based on increase in tanker ship size to widen and deepen <coughs> the navigation channel. And to do that, one fell swoop. They had to scoop 10 million cubic yards out. And to this day, every year, the maintenance dredging is millions of cubic yards. And that's a pipeline dredge that's going to fill the hopper of this thing up, and it'll go offshore and dump it in a pre-described uh, disposal area. But as you can imagine, what happens in the process of dredging is, of course, a variety of fauna comes up, including Dungeness crab. And these, these are more important crab than those little tiny dime-sized ones. These are one, one and a half years old. They're down in subtidal channels, and they're of an age that they're getting ready to leave the system. They're almost to sexual maturity, and some aren't too far off from the commercial fishery. And the commercial fishery drove an amazing oh, what, series of investigations in the field, and computations that led to the development of DIM, the dredge impact model that was viewed very dimly by the Army Corps. And it essentially bundled information about po uh, crab population dynamics, their age and size, most importantly the season of the year, the location in the estuary. The Corps would say what year, time of year, location they were going to dredge, every 
cubic yard, they sucked up, there was an entrainment function functioning in the crab. Not every crab sucked up the skill, so there was a mortality factor based on year and age. You computed a loss, you used natural mortality rates to kill those crab forward into uh, near adulthood. And when all is said and done, it told us that about 40 to 150,000 legal males would be lost, which turns out to be 1 to 4 percent of the annual land. So we thought, well, that's done. Um, and a lot of theses came out of it, so it was a good deal. But the court declared that a significant environmental perturbation, and they had to do something. After adjusting gear and season and so on, they had to mitigate for these old crowd, for these lost adult fishery males. And Maya suggested a way to do it. Uh, what we eventually had to do was study where to put shell habitat, new shell habitat. And in a whole bunch of work, Olapa is simply depicted here because it's, uh, it's consistent with the Olapa, or sorry, Grace Harbor phenomenon. The majority of these subtitle one-year-old, two-year-old juveniles live in these little tiny subtitle channels. And the goal eventually was to locate mitigation habitat in an area that would receive an inoculum, little crab recruitment coming in that pelagic megalop stage, and yet place them so that when they outgrew that habitat, they were big enough, they would go down into subtitle channels that were conducive to growth and survival. And a great part of uh, Sean and Kirsten's PhD work uh, involved trying to ascertain the extent to which they used intertidal flats and what kinds of intertidal flats they used. So let's see if this works. They set up, as you can see, the crab gate, these large, uh, almost like fight nets that channeled migrating crab under a camera, and then they took pictures. And let's see if this will work. There's that. There's overwhelming. Sherry? And you're looking at what the camera spot on a typical day. This is water ebbing, so it's flowing off the tide flat back into the channel. Those crab have been up there on the tide flat at the flood tide, foraging, eating, and by the, you tell me the number, the hundreds of thousands or more, they're retreating with the ebb tide to get back into those little subtidal channels during low tide. And it's just phenomenal, the numbers that are doing this, and uh, Kirsten and Sean added a, a nice touch in that they wanted to use telemetry to figure out sort of a typical daily excursion, if you will. So they tag these things, um, and these recordings are, I think they're a single crowd, but it's uh, indicative of all that were tagged, and these positions are daily. And then what starts to happen here is a series of extreme spring <coughs> tides. And during the night flood, that animal goes up and comes down and goes up and comes down. Uh, so that very typically, they were making one-way excursions of about a half a kilometer or so. And that helped tremendously in deciding where to start testing the plausible location of shell mitigation habitat. So there were escapades like this to put it out in different areas. Eventually, the Army Corps bought, truly in the mountains, an oyster shell out of Willapong that to them had no value whatsoever other than settlement substrate for culch, or as culch. And they barged that to Grace Harbor because they had to make shell habitat and an amount that's computed to handle recruitment of those little crab and then account for natural mortality forward to the fishery and everybody would come out even. And sure enough, the crab came. But there were problems, and the main problems uh, came to be that the shell sinks, and that other species of crab recruit to the shell, they like it, and they outcompete the dungeon nest. So, to 2006, every year they made more and more and more of these plots because they were either sinking or they were lived in by a different crab. And uh, just to pick an example, this worked perfectly in 1992. One year later, there was virtually no dungeon nest, and <coughs> instead, it replaced by the common shore crab. 
so that was a great lesson in what, the best intentions totally gone awry. But as an aside saga as to why that shell sank <coughs> so repeatedly, there's probably no water bottle in there. Um, I'll just tell you this very quickly. You may not know the story, but many of you do. The reason it sinks is the two species of burrowing shrimp, a uh, mud shrimp and the ghost shrimp, uh, Upagibia and Neotropea, in high densities, they burrow at high densities. Oh, I think you would see. Um, they, they liquefy the substrate so much, or they bioturbate so much, that shoals sink. And uh, that's noted here. <coughs> you see uh, adult oysters that have just been covered with sediment through the inordinate burrowing activity of these two species of shrimp. They're trying to grow commercial oysters. You can imagine what a dilemma you face. But there is a great immediate quick solution. Um, for the last almost 50 years in this state, and Jim Rusink knows it well, um, there are permits granted to uh, set aside water quality standards in contractors like this guy in a helicopter are hired to spray whatever my allocation is, 10 hectares or 20 hectares with carbon rail. Uh, you can buy it for pets and gardens and stuff. And insecticide, they spray it on vastly higher concentrations and solubility and it's spread all over with the first flooding tide and it works. So those are the intended victims of carburetal and all these little specks are the excess undissolved that again will uh, will affect much greater expanses of the inner tidal than that purposely plotted. <coughs> and of course this is the great controversy that kills lots of stuff, including those young of your Dungeness crab. Juvenile English soul, all there to rear happily in the ocean habitat and march off to supply commercial fisheries. And uh, even more bizarre, of course, at the next flood time, you saw Sean's pictures, the movies of crab coming up. They arrive, the adults or the larger juveniles, and feed on that huge uh, day's worth of killed animal, and they're poisoned and they die. So this is very dramatic. Uh, almost melodramatic, and politically it has been battled for decades to the point I read that the uh, settlement, out of court settlement about a decade back requires the growers to have a different alternative this year, this very year, 2012. So all of this has collectively galvanized the coastal fishers, Dungeness crab fishers, they're well organized, and they're quick to act, and they're very political when they perceive threats to their fishers. Uh, those that are listed here, but also in time, over time, things like the expansion of poor grass that alters beneficial crab habitat, the oh, short-lived invasion of green crab that actually provided a doctoral thesis. Um, all of these studies are based on a perception of dramatic impact. Sometimes it turns out not to be so. The eventual true loss to fisheries are often really small, but the costs put into the studies are inordinate. Any cost-benefit ratio would come close to justifying it. But it's a lesson in the power of politics to make the studies happen nonetheless. Now, in all of this with Dungeness Crab, you know, they come and go, they go up and down, recruitment varies, but that, that is not attributed, to get to another word in the talk title, so much to climate in a unidirectional sense of climate change, it's ever worse or colder or warmer, as other physical processes that enhance recruitment or maybe even lead to strong air classes that cannibalize sequentially and sort of make those, uh, those cycles appear for biotic reasons. But in this last saga, uh, climate is a real factor and a main feature of, of the talk, and that's the <coughs> well-known, well-studied saga of the snow crab and other species in the eastern Bering Sea. Uh, this is where they live uh, in a, in a well-studied system. The important part of this diagram or this schematic for us are what's called the middle and the outer domain, uh, bounded by about a 50 to 100 meter isobath and then 100 up to the shelf edge. The Pribilof Island, St. Matthew's Island, just for reference, the little arrows depicting general trajectories of current 
are important in this case to appreciate that the general slow flying current uh, over the Bering Sea Shelf, eastern Bering Sea Shelf, tends to be southeast to northwest. And that's an important part of the story eventually. The nice thing about this fishery is that now for over 30 years, uh, the Alaska Fishery Science Center, based out of the Kodiak Lab, has conducted these exhaustive trawl surveys. And this is just uh, indicative of what they do. These are fixed grid points on 20 square nautical mile um, spacings. And every, every, every spring and summer, and some of you have been on those cruises, they go and they pull trawl nets according to protocol, and they count and weigh everything that comes up. And there are these phenomenal data sets and they are the most generous people in sharing them for the purpose of theses or otherwise NPRB proposals that evoke these and why use them. So the Alaska Center has been great that way. There were times when the Bering Sea was covered, its benthos was almost a blanket of snow crab. Crustaceans were a huge biomass in these systems. And this is virtually, again, a monoculture of adult female snow crab. But uh, things change, always change, and they did change. So this graph showing you data from the 80s to almost the present shows both the uh, abundance estimates from those trawl surveys and the landings. And um, at 4 this morning, Andre reminded me that this 50% is a maximum guideline harvest level that's usually set at 25%. At any rate, they estimate abundance. It's never done in the case of Dungeness crab. They set a quota, and the fleet with allocations is dispersed to pick it up. And it crashed, as you can see here, and was declared overfished, and rebuilding plans based on threshold or uh, reference point metrics kicked in. And it took almost a decade. It is now recovered, right? Hmm? Rebuilt. Yes, it's rebuilt. Uh, but still, the landings never come back. And this is almost a mirror image of what happened to Red King Crab. Uh, 1980 was the biggest year in history. And three years later, it was closed. It was just so dramatic. Um, it also was the source of federal disaster relief money that helped fuel all of the papers and et alls that Andre refers to that passed through ADF and G Alaska and Fish and Game into our program here. We're very, very fortunate. Um, it is a compl complicated reproductive biology ecology. And just very briefly, uh, this is in a category of crab that have a terminal molt. Dungeness crab hypothetically never stop molting. Every year they'll do it again. They'll grow bigger and bigger and bigger. This species, in the case of both sexes, will eventually you pick the cues, the stimuli, in one fell swoop, one molting leap, go from uh, this, this cloud of points up into this cloud of points. And what happens, uh, they're both sexually mature, they're both uh, actively involved in gametogenesis, but they go from this morphometrically immature, hard to say, to morphometrically mature stage. Again, in one molt, when an individual does that, it's done. It's a terminal molt, it's anagysis to use the term. And this is legal size as determined by the industry. Um, this animal, this male, can breed one of two categories of female. This one can breed both of those categories of females. So two guys, different styles. Um, this is the big, heavy clod you eat that in a restaurant, morphometrically mature male. Um, so extreme sexual dimorphism in this species. These are females, and again, in one mold, they will go from an immature adolescent stage uh, to adulthood. And morphologically, that's very easy to see in the expansion of this abdominal flap that allows uh, shelter and incubation of the eggs extruded to maturity. Um, when this female molts, she is soft, and she will copulate and can breed with either of those other two categories of male. Individuals can store sperm for the rest of their life, viable sperm, or in a hard shell state, very unusual, they can continue breeding annually, but only with the hard shell, morphometrically mature male. Okay, enough said about that. It's a very complicated reproductive process. Movement is an important part of this variancy 
story about the individual movement of females from that middle domain that to leap forward is the most important place for them to sell, the mid part of the Bering Sea shelf. Uh, over time and age, out to the edge of the shelf, the outer domain. And that has major implications for where larval larvae are hatched, where eggs are hatched and larvae go. But the other thing that's most profound about this species and uh, harks back to that trend in the landings is a uh, major contraction in distribution over the last 15, 20 years from southeast to northwest, a decline of 80% or more in total abundance, and a disruption of larval supply that's all been packeted in this so-called environmental ratchet hypothesis. So that's what happened. Um, this is uh, just an arbitrary reference point, a latitude that's going into the purple off islands. You're looking from offshore onto the shelf. That's the Alaska Peninsula there. And that was typical for all survey data abundance, relative abundance of the uh, mid 70s, early 80s. That's uh, 2000, and that's what it looks like to this day. So they retracted and they decreased a lot. And what, what difference does that make? Well, one aspect of the study that came from, uh, that was supported by the Federal Disaster Relief Money, was to look at the reproductive biology. And what you see here, the typical size frequency portrayals of adult female crab. And this red line is an arbitrary reference point at about 60 millimeters carapace width. So your eye can see that in the north part, all the adult females are smaller, and in the southeastern part, they're bigger. So the meaning of that is it results in smaller size and lower fecundity, fewer eggs per capita. And when they get far enough north, it's really cold. The bottom water is exceedingly cold, so much so that an individual female may only extrude eggs and hatch them every two years instead of annually. And this is what it looks like schematically, where one is the best, most profuse, spawning, biggest female, and along this gradient, it gets smaller, and egg output reduces tremendously. And on a population basis, spatially, what's happened with that retraction is that the center of reproductive output has also moved to the northwest. And why, why should we care about that? Well, it comes uh, heavily to bear on the issue of climate. And the literature in the last five to eight years is replete with climate um, analyses and um, uh, major ecosystem shifts, uh, warming trends and the effect on biotic communities. Recruitment variation is uh, driven by climate forcing top-down effects. All uh, has led to a very, very rich literature. And what began to drive this uh, is shown in this graph of sort of average bottom water temperature, say, around the Pribilof Island district, that in what's now the famous regime shift, that jargon, beginning in the mid-70s was a dramatic warming of bottom water temperature. It goes up and down over time, but this went up. And it it's, has stayed that way for a couple of decades. It turns out that the temperature preferendum, the best physiological uh, temperature you can be in as a little crab, is about zero to two degrees. So this was very, very warm. And um, the, the system is so interesting. The fact of warmer cold influences a number of things that bear on the life history of crab and other species like the extent of ice cover in the winter. So here is an example of the southernmost extent of ice in the cold years. And this is ice, and a lot less ice, in the warm years. And that, that has major consequences. That ice then sets up the geographic uh, spatial scale of what's now famously called the cold pole. And that's simply defined as the water mass, the bottom water mass, that is less than two degrees centigrade. And if you are a species in need of that or adapted to that in a community that favors it, you have more or less of that community depending on the extent of ice and the, the temperatures of the previous winter. So that's how big the cold pool can be in a cold year and how small in a warm year. We are interested in looking at the 
fate and consequence effect on a larva depending on where its mother was at the time it was hatched relative to cold pools and ice and so on. So this too detailed model to talk much about was built by people at uh, the Alaska Center and Al Hartman at PML that is the ocean side of the model that produces salinity and currents and temperature used to drive the little hypothetical crab larvae that are hatched into the water column, allowed to develop through those larval stages for 90 days and then settle out to see where they go, what the particles, the larval particles do, what temperature they encounter when they settle, where they are at geographically, and how connected different regions are in supplying one another. So it was uh, set up as these series of larval release grids that have actual NIMS trawl survey data. And the model was run to see where the larvae of cell 7 went compared to the larvae in other cells. That's the gist of it. And the larvae spew out like this. <clears throat> Uh, this happens to be temperature, but velocity, uh, high velocity or slow velocity years, all this can be captured in the models to study and appreciate where the larvae go. Because, uh, and then the connectivity is summarized over 25 years of these runs using actual annual data from the trawl surveys to say that by and large, these cells in the middle domain, and, uh, sorry, the middle and outer domain are critical to one another, but the larvae produced there go either nowhere else beneficial, those that go to the shelf edge or larval wastage anyway, they don't go to the inner or the coastal domain, they don't go back to the south, east, and they often skew up to the Gulf of Panagera or the Chukchi Sea. They're too important tension cells are on St. Matthew's Island and the Pribilof Islands. And just in a long, complicated story, those are seen as critical to the replenishment and renewal of strong year classes that recurrently now seem to be on a seven-year cycle. The things that you can do with this, in part, is to determine for each and every year how many of the larvae hatched went someplace that, upon settlement, they were potentially in this beneficial thermal stratum or went to a place that was too warm or just too cold. And uh, for the most part, it says in warm years when there's a very abbreviated, truncated, cold pool, not very many of the larvae get to a good spot. And in cold years, a much larger percentage. Um, we like this because it it lends itself to this great hypothesis that George Hunt and colleagues developed first in 2002 and then just republished, uh, applied to Pollock, the oscillating control hypothesis. And the gist in our case is that if you're a crab larva, as was suggested by Dave Summer to right back in the 1980s, Dave works at the Alaska Center, a snow crab larva is best hatched in a cold year when the ice is extensive, it retreats late, there are ice edge blooms that set up at this time that the snow crab larvae are hatching. Chlorophyll is a proxy for copepods of appropriate feeding size. So cold years are great for survival and recruitment of those crab larvae. Now, something keeps chewing away on the edge of these patterns of distribution of the species. And very important part of the story is the dramatic change. Uh, I wish this was the Bering Sea, but hey, I think it's the Gulf of Alaska, Papua. But it's emblematic of the you know, just dramatic changes in the benthic community composition from the cold regime period into the warm period. Uh, a significant loss of the benthic crustacean biomass replacement of a variety of commercial uh, forage fish. And uh, these interesting analyses by Franz Miller at the University of Alaska looking at an increased trophic, uh, average trophic level with increase in bottom temperature, their conclusion that with that warming there was a huge expansion of a subarctic fish-centric community into that southeastern middle domain Bering Sea shell. They crop down the crab. Any recruit coming back there today 
is lost, like in the smoking picture down the throat of cod and other, other and various flatfish. And near bottom water temperature is a dominant controlling process in the system. Um, this just confirms that the cod are finding and eating very, very small stages of snow crab. These filled circles are what the trawl survey mesh captures. The cod are eating very, very, very small crab that range from about one to three years old. And they probably don't affect or cause cycles, but they constantly hammer away at that southern, southeastern portion. And ultimately, the question is, why don't they come back? What's it going to take for them to come back? And the environmental ratchet hypothesis just notes that circulation favors those larvae hatched and luckily retained over the middle domain. They're best to land in a, about a two degree pool of water. There was a dramatic northward shift um, that began to affect recruitment. And expansion of the females back south for the adult population is really challenging because the current circulation patterns are in the totally wrong direction. Uh, there is now a very small local spawning stock. And you have these ground fish chomping away on the edge of it. So but what now to wrap it up might the future hold? Well, right now is an interesting potential uh, community ecology experiment. It's been cold now for several years. And while it gets cold, it gets warm and cold and it flip-flops annually, that's not enough one year to drive out the car or the predators or to bring back the snow crab. Like that dramatic rise in temperature, you need a sustained, we think, hotter or colder regime or period to affect the change. But it's getting cold and it'll be interesting to see if that changes distribution of uh, the subarctic fish community in a way that benefits uh, crab recruitment. Uh, and these are just a sequence that fill a out of that same very dramatic, huge spatial extent of the cold pool. What is the future of all? Al Herman sent this, and I actually wrote it down on my cheat sheet. That green line going forward is the, who knows that? Global. Model number three. And uh, <laughs> the Canadians built it. That I do know for sure. Uh, but you can see that pine cast captured that dramatic temperature increase that led to the uh, regime shift, the warming period, and that whole dramatic relocation. Going forward, this isn't a good trend. It doesn't bode well for snow crab who love that zero to two degree uh, water. But this is the future, it's unknown and yet it's increasingly paid attention to as a sense of what the future may hold for this one fishery and many like it. And no doubt is uh, part of the sense of ecosystem-based management because of, you know, it's not just crab or anything by themselves are alone in it. So, uh, almost on time in my remaining 45 minutes after the introductions, I hope you have enjoyed the Crab Cave, which was a title I gave Trevor. You don't know this, but behind the scenes, um, Julia used to always rewrite lecture titles of uh, people because they were boring and dumb. And I knew this, so I panicked and I sent Trevor a selection of, I think, four titles. And then he wrote back. This was really funny, but I didn't look at that. So I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and finally I said, well, how about Crabble Cave? And he said, that is so weird. <laughs> and anyway, thank you for your attention. There are so many people to thank. Students, former postdocs on the, what is it, our left-hand side, all of the colleagues uh, now down in South America, Lobo and Billy and Carolina, Julian Burris in Iceland, faculty over time, Arbor Hickey in Oceanography, and then lots and lots of agency scientists, Sarah and Herman, Phyllis Stamino, the ADAFMG and the Kodiak NIMPS people, uh, Pat Livingston, and the industry has been very, very supportive all through these years. So thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>
Well, I should have mentioned there is a new generation and a far more quantitative generation. So, uh, an ongoing PhD thesis with Andre Bacotti, who's here, um, and then a couple of years ago, James Murphy under Jim Anderson are really helping to look in more detail at the management planning side of, of snow crown fishery. So they're, they're in good shape. Tom? Uh, Dave, were you one of the original owners of the Elbow Room or not? <laughs> oh. <laughs> not? What is your name doing on the wall there? Right. Well, as Andre pointed out, there's so many Dave Armstrongs. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Elbow Room. That's one of the stories I was not talking about. Uh, two quick reactions, please. Um, number one, why, is, why are crab alone subjected to the length base analysis and the annual catch limit. If that were prudent from a precautionary point of view, uh -huh. wouldn't all the species be so sorry? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you do that and stand behind me and start speaking and I'll wait right now. Yeah, number two. Number two. That's um, where I'm the great survey, wine. The survey trawl results without an a tickle chain mm -hmm. tell one third of the story of the real abundance of snow okay. crab. So the point to be made is that there is a catchability coefficient and that is by no means 100% efficient and it's intended to catch two dozen species, but independent surveys and lots of engineering um, have led to far more precise and much higher trawl density uh, catches and, and much higher estimates in, in those studies. And, and there are Alaska Center people here who can later say, why it hasn't been comprehensively adapted. I don't know. Do you believe in the Tinkle chain, Dave? Uh, <laughs> be careful. Well, you know, I've used a Tinkle chain in times past. All of that uh, Dungeness crab work is based on a Tinkle I, I can't say, I simply don't know enough about the um, behavior, on bottom behavior of the other species that are targeted in the Fall survey to know if a Tinkle chain would affect them for good or bad. And my impression is that they're sort of doing an average thing, given the wide array of species they're targeting. Your career has helped many thousands of families in this state and in Alaska. Mine has? Yeah, it has. I didn't know that. Thank you. <laughs> Andre. Uh, slightly different type of question. Um, this is the uh, Bevan series for sustainable fisheries. Mm -hmm. Given all you've told us about, well, Stick to snow type, which I sort of vaguely understand. What what do we mean by sustainable snow crab fishery, given all of the factors and biology and currents and you know, what do we mean by sustainable in, in that kind of organism? And Dungeness is a good example as well. When you think back to those wild five to six fold swings, you wonder at one level, well, is that sustainable? And I I think that sustainability does not mean constancy doesn't need a perfect flat line of guaranteed landings decade after decade. I think it means um, science and assessment good enough to know when it is going up, going down, adjusting quotas accordingly, but it in no sense should be presumed to guarantee constant landings, constant income. I think it's more sustainability, as I wrestle with your question, almost from a community consumer fisher standpoint. It is, in some sense, helping to ensure that year to year and decade to decade, there is a viable fisher, which is sustainable, uh, to be exploited. And that there is enough scrutiny to know, based on reference points, when things are getting dicey and the proverbial control rules in place to do something about it Ratchet it down, turn it off. Okay, now you answer it. <laughs> <laughs> different talk, different day. <laughs> Julia. Why is the Maya sick? The Maya, well, the living Maya? Oh, yeah, the other Maya. Why didn't they sink? Well, they died in C2. Yeah. And I always remember one helicopter flight, a little mapping by air, in an early spring after severe winter. And we were looking at, couldn't understand this texture we were seeing. And when we went down to ground truth, it was so severe in the scouring effect in that winter that it had just uncovered millions of Maya that were now about half
half exposed. Right. And so processes effectively bring them to the surface and let's make this up. You know, flood, up tide, move them in a way they begin to interlock and uh, they form those little riprap uh, oases. Riprap, but they don't sink. If anything, they would slowly dissolve and maybe turbulence and severe winters will move them off of a given tide flat down into the tide. What's also interesting, but you didn't ask it, is that <laughs> there don't seem to be local species that form that same kind of intertidal, even subtidal material. Um, Jennifer may have another opinion, but native oysters never would have worked that way. They just packed too closely. And I've never seen the big horse clams or people making that same material. It wasn't until two exotics, Maya and Pacific Oyster, that it existed. Russ? Yeah, how do you, either of the crab species that you described have significant disease problems over the years? Well, snow crab for sure. Um, and Frank, uh, Frank Morato, for the Alaska Center, has been studying the Japan Jensen, a variety of diseases, the bitter crab syndrome. Um, and that has some implication for the commercial fishery. And the disease question was asked in some seminar. They're just really hard to observe and follow uh, in wild populations. There have been little occasional reports of oddities and even mentioned this crab, but no profound pervasive disease in Time for one more question. <clears throat> To the, to the one who we go. This was uh, produced at the time that the Bhagwan, you remember the Bhagwan in Oregon? Was very famous, and my student cohort in that era thought that we would adopt that cult. So that's the <laughs> that's one. Thank you very much for coming.